On today's episode of the show, I speak with Pat Bradley. He is a New York-based filmmaker and has done a feature, a few shorts. The discussion gets off to a bit of a slow start as we're talking about accents and other random stuff, but as it progresses, we get into a lot of useful content for filmmakers out there. We talk about casting and finding a crew, a very important piece of information around contracts, and a bit of what not to send in an audition tape, actors. Before we get to a quick sponsor break and my talk with Pat Bradley, just a reminder, my name is Milo Dennison, and this is Diary of an Unemployed Actor. Pat Bradley, you are a native New Yorker. Brooklyn or Queens. Manhattan? Queens. Queens. Okay. What, here's, here's my thing about New York, and, and tell me your opinion on this, because I'm always, it, like, if I do an audition or something like that, they're like, hey, we want a New York accent. Mm-hmm. And I'm like... I've been to New York a couple of times and I haven't been to too many, all of the boroughs and stuff, but um, I don't hear that New York accent that people think that there is. Mm-hmm. So does that accent actually exist? That like, Hey, I'm walking here kind of accent. Yes, it does. Okay. It does. It depends where you go. You know, also a lot of New York is now is gotta be 40% implant. So it's slowly, uh, slowly dying. Ah, uh, okay. But I mean, you can you can tell, you know, the way I speak that you know it has a a definite certain, sound to it. A yeah, New yeah. York sound to it. So, but it does it does exist. The further deeper in Brooklyn you go, you really have that hard accent, and every borough is different. So, every borough has a a little bit different of an accent. So, have you always wanted to be a filmmaker? Uh, no. Can you do a New York accent? Can no, I'm asked? terrible. No, my, mine's the generic, like fake, you know, okay. hey, what are you talking about? You know, like the, the terrible New York. Which is most of what you hear anyway. It's, you know, like the stereotyped accent. Yeah. I'm doing an, I'm actually got a self tape I'm doing tomorrow. And it's based on a real person. And he's from New York, uh, but you could clearly tell that he spent a lot of his life in Boston. So he's kind of got a mix of the oh, two. That's, that's, that's got to be a rough accent. Y- yeah. Yeah. I've literally been like, kind of watching video of him and stuff and trying to imitate it. Uh, but anyway, so you have not always wanted to be a filmmaker. Not really. Uh, I started out uh, writing music, which turned into uh, writing music videos, which turned into shooting music videos, which turned into writing film, which now turned into shooting film. I see. So did you originally want to be in music? Yeah, but my voice is awful. So okay. I couldn't... Uh, couldn't sing, couldn't rap, couldn't yell right. So heavy metal, rap, R&B, all that was out of the question. So I stuck to writing and uh, it just naturally progressed. Okay. You started a film production company. Talk about that because most people, when they start to get into filmmaking, it's usually a specific area like, okay, I want to get into acting or I want to get into writing. And they just kind of focus on that and submit scripts. But it seems like you just kind of were like, Hey, I want to, I want, this is what I want to do. I'm going to write, I'm going to direct, I'm going to make my film. So I'm just going to make it happen. So talk about that process a little bit, like getting into that. It, it comes from the music in order to get paid as a, uh, you know, to write for music. I created a music production company. So I was able through that, I was able to get paid for writing for music uh, to produce music uh, at a point in time. I was managing artists. So all that fell under one umbrella. So I don't really like to just focus on one thing. I like to try to do as much as I could. I guess it's a little bit of a control freak type of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, it kind of just made sense for me to do that with film. So I kind of just uh, just went into it, just dove in and tried to see how it worked out. And it worked out well so far. With your writing process, did you find that challenging at all, switching from music writing to script writing? No, not really. I did, uh, when I was doing music writing, I started, I mean, in the mid-90s when I was younger uh, with all local, you know, local people. And then it just progressed into more professional setting. And as I started that, it was early 2000, maybe even 99. Um I was editing a lot of people's uh, stories, like short scripts and things like that, because I was the only one pretty much writing at the time that people knew locally. 
And I wasn't really charging, you know, what people charge, you know, nowadays. So I wound up just uh, just here, right? And then uh, I wound up getting a book. I want to say maybe the screenwriting Bible. And then I just learned the format from there. And that was it. With script doctoring, because you've done some script doctoring as well, right? Yeah. That's been most of my work. Okay. When doing script doctoring work, what is involved in that type of work? Is it helping with the dialogue? Is it helping with overall? Like what, what, what exactly goes into kind of doc, you know, helping somebody with their script basically. Every, everyone is usually different. A lot of times it's dialogue. Uh, for some reason, a lot of people just can't write dialogue. And most of the time you get people writing the same, uh, writing how they speak or writing the same for every character. Yeah. So they have every character using the same inflections, same tones, the same everything. And it's just, they want to get the dialogue across. They don't think about that character's personality. So it's uh, it's mostly dialogue, but there's a lot of times where I rewrite an ending. It really all depends on what you get hired for, like what they feel that uh, their weaknesses are. Okay. So I actually do some like script coverage service also. So I'm able to read a script and see things that, you know, maybe somebody else might not be able to see. So they send it to me and be like, okay, we just need help with the dialogue. So I'll finish it, you know, I'll do the help you know, do the dialogue and everything. And then I'll, when I send it back to them, I'll send them a couple of notes like, Hey, you know, the pacing is a little off in this section. This is a little off in this section. Do you want me to correct it or not? And then they'll read it and either do it or don't do it. But, uh, it does help with, uh, you know, a lot of, because everybody has more than one weakness. So. Yeah, totally. Any tips for writing dialogue for anyone listening? Talk to yourself. As the character? As the characters talk different voices, just do what you can. You know, everybody sounds different. So you want to get like, I sound different from my neighbor, even though we're in the same, same location, everybody speaks different. Some people more intelligent. Some people are not so intelligent. So, you know, you kind of have to figure out your character's personality first. Mm -hmm. So if your character is dull, you know, he's not going to be using big ambitious words where if you have a smarter character, he's not going to dumb himself down. So you kind of have to find the balance and it's, I mean, realistically, it's all about character. Once you figure out your character's personality and then you can become each character as you type, you look okay. a little crazy. If you're typing at Starbucks or coffee shop or anyway, you look a little crazy talking to yourself and doing voices, but when you're home alone with the door shut, it's not too much of a problem. When you're writing, What's your writing process like? Do you, are you a cafe writer or are oh, you no. an at-home writer? What's the what's your process like? I'm a little bit of everything. I, I don't I don't usually go to a cafe or anything. If I'm going to go and write, it's outside, kind of like uh, around the beach, around the water, somewhere private. Uh, but most of the time, I take the laptop and go in my kitchen, outside my backyard, in the house, or. Uh, since now most of the the software, uh, screenwriting software has apps, I do a lot of it on my phone. Oh, the okay. problem is formatting on your phone is next to impossible. So you pretty much just write everything as an action just to save time. And then when you get to your desktop, you just uh, throw it to the cloud, download it, and reformat it. But a lot of it is actually done there. Do you have a schedule? Like uh, some people always write in the morning or always write certain times of days or have like a limit, like I'm going to sit down every day and write full, you know, X number of words. I used to, I used to have a strict four page minimum uh, that I would do every day. Uh, now, not so much because now I'm getting a lot more directing work. So it's, you know, it's kind of not exact. I got to prepare shoots and, you know, so it's not exactly four pages, but uh, I am a morning person. So I'm up at 4 a.m. every day. And I do a lot of idea creating in the gym. So I go to the gym in the morning for about two hours. Uh, I try to formulate, you know, in between sets, I'm on my phone trying to formulate, go home, do some emails, you know, do all that. And then, you know, start going into the uh, whatever I got down in the gym for the day. And a lot of it. And then right before I go to sleep, I usually read through the notes. If I'm working on one project over and over and over again before I go to sleep, hopefully it comes to me in my sleep as well, which a lot of times it actually does. It's a, it's a long process. 
It's it's a great thing about modern technology is the fact that you have the phone that has the software and under the notes. I'm I'm similar way. I mean, I know you can carry around notebooks and stuff too, but I'll have an idea and I've got like a notepad on my phone and it's just like, ah, idea, make a note of that. And then that way I can refer back to it later. It's fantastic that we have that as a resource. The the good thing is too, I, I used to, I'm so used to the notepad. So I have a, uh, a Samsung Galaxy Note as my phone. It has mm-hmm. a little S Pen on it. So I could just sit there and just jot down notes anytime instead of typing. And I, you pretty much just write down what you want, send it, and it turns it into a text form. Okay. And then I could just go adjust it after. So it's kind of like a new age notepad. Nice, nice. Uh, mine's not quite that fancy. I will use the voice note quite a bit now too. I've started doing that. Just like voice note for later. It doesn't understand the New York accent. Oh. <laughs> it's so it never gets it right. I tried it when I had um yeah we were in the middle of uh, shooting uh, shooting my feature so we wound up uh, having to separate the shoot so we we shot like eight days and then we didn't have enough we kind of got stuck with like sixty six minutes mm-hmm. so we weren't sure you know you can't really do anything with sixty six minutes it's a little I mean realistically technically it is a feature but you know it's a little too short and then it's too long for a short too short for a feature. So we wound up having to save a little more money and uh, shoot another day, you know, later the next year. So I had, uh, in between that, I actually had um, shoulder surgery. So I couldn't do anything. And that was the time when we decided to go into the next day to fill, to fill it out. So I was like, shit, you know, I can, can I curse? You can curse, yeah. Okay. Whew. I curse all the I'm, time. I've been, I've been trying to hold it because I wasn't sure, but sometimes it slips out. So Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I was trying not to. <laughs> yeah, that's, my, that's my New Year's resolution this year, is trying to stop cursing. I was trying. Well, that was good. That was good. I, I went, what, 10 minutes with uh, cursing? <laughs> so I wound up trying to do the um, text to talk with, uh, you know, with the shoulder surgery, and it was not even close. <laughs> it was just going all. Now, from now, from then, I have weird words that it automatically goes to now from the, the autocorrect, mm-hmm. just from that time. It just sticks and it, it didn't work out well for me. Yeah, mine works so right as long as I'm in a quiet environment. If it's a loud environment, then it's pretty useless. Well, you have a nice, clear voice. I sound like I have marbles with everything in my mouth, so it doesn't really uh, <laughs> doesn't really work well. Yeah, I've got the very generic West Coast accent. You're from California? Uh, I'm from Washington State, so yeah, close enough. Is that film that you were just talking about, Into the Valley? Into the Vale? Yeah, that was Into the Valley. So that was your first feature film. Yes. Where did that come from? Uh, so the idea came from my partner on the film, Nick Buscarino. He used to go to school. I don't, I don't remember the name of the school, but it was up in Massachusetts. So he would come home every couple of days, uh, every couple of weekends. And he has a long drive. So from New York, uh, from Massachusetts to New York, there's like a stretch of highway that's no lights, no service. You get nothing for like a good 20, 30 miles. Mm-hmm. So all he had was um, Sirius XM radio. And uh, during that time when he was coming home, it was uh, Sirius XM doo-wop channel. It was the only channel he was able to get. So he got about an hour of the Four Seasons music. So he came up with this concept that... Uh, he had a, a character who was a lounge singer who was obsessed with Frankie Valley. And so he had a, like a short film that he pitched me when he got home. So I told him, I was like, write it, you know, we'll, we'll sh- try to shoot it as a practice. We did like a couple of practice shorts just to really see before uh, we went into this. And I mean, you know, they're never coming out. That's how good they came out, but uh, you know, they were bad. <laughs> so I was like, you know, maybe if we can, if we just, cause we kind of just, jumped into it and wrote something with like seven locations and 10 characters, you know, it was a little too much for the first time. So his story had two characters, one location, it was a hotel room and it was just two characters. So he rides up writing it and he's like, what do you think? So, you know, reading through it, it was like, all right, but you know, it's kind of just a scene. There was no real beginning, middle and end to it. There was no story, just a scene. So I was like, I kind of want to know what happens a little bit after. So maybe we could just do one more location with something after. So I was like, do you mind if I just take that part and try to add to it? So he's like, no, 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 go ahead. So we did that. And then we were just, you know, we were sitting there looking at it and it was like, fuck, I want more. 
And he's like, I want to know why this did this. So I was like, yeah, but I want to know why he did this. And then I was like, all right, let's write 20 pages each and then we'll combine it and see if we can create something. But max 20, no, because I write very long and fast. 90 pages I could pretty much bang out in a week if I had something in my head. So I was like, I have an idea. Let me just do 20 pages. That's it. So we both write the 20 pages. We put it together and we were on opposite ends of the character. So he wanted the character one way. I wanted the character the other way. So then I was like, you know what? It was your concept. We'll go with yours. But he's like, I kind of like yours better. So it was, you know, we were just like, we were stuck. So I was like, I really want to go further into the character. Because the, the movie is pretty much a character study. So I was like, I really want to dive into it and just go. I was like, do you mind if I just take it and run with it? So he's like, yeah. He's like, but you know, I, I kind of want to write also. So I was like, you know what? Let's give each other like three months. See what we come up with, however many pages we can get into three months, and then we'll mix it, put it together, and we'll see if we can chop it somewhere. Since at the time I had an agent, so he was like, you know, we'll see if we can, I was going to get pitch the idea to my agent, and he was like, yeah. He's like, just finish it, and he's like, I can shop it with both of you. So we were like, all right, cool. So we write it. I wound up writing 140-something pages, and <laughs> he, you know, he was significantly less, but uh, we didn't really, we couldn't figure out what the hell the character was about so then we wound up just picking apart beginnings from both of ours middles and then the end we got so it was like we need more character because you know in order for us to afford to shoot it ourselves uh we would need pretty much to focus more on character development than big fancy sets and all that so we had two versions of the story we had one version that we were going to try to shop and then one version that if all else failed, we could shoot it ourselves. And when I we gave the uh, the film to my agent, he was like, "There's no fucking way I could sell this to anybody." He's like, "It's really depressing." He's like, "You're gonna have to change it." I was like, uh, "I'm not really interested in changing it. Like, I kind of want it to be like that." So we wound up, you know, going back and forth, and then we cut a whole lot out of it, and then we were like, "You know what?" We could do this ourselves. It's not going to be that crazy. A lot of it is simple set. You know, there's real no sets. Everything could be on location. So then we wind up scouting all that. And then as we were doing that, uh, we reached out to a couple of, uh, I guess, B-list actors, if you want to call them, to see if they would, uh, you know, play the lead role of Chris slash Frankie. And uh, one guy was like, there's no way in hell. He's like, I would ever be in a movie like that. <laughs> nice. I was like, all right. Was like, That's fine. I was yeah. like, you know. Could have just is, simply you know, said so. no, you're not available. Or I mean, I, I don't mind. I, I like, you know, I like it like that. Yeah. So he was honest and that was okay. And another guy wanted like a ridiculous amount of money. So then uh, he's like, well, I have a producer that would come on, you know, and get us the money. So I was like, okay, we met with the producer. And the producer was a nice guy and everything, but then he was like, well, you know, I really want my niece to come in and play this role. And I have my girlfriend and she's going to, you know, be really interested in this role. So then I was like, okay, I know, I know what it is. So I was like, I'll meet with them. And if they fit, then, you know, we can go forward. And the girlfriend was a really terrible actress. Like for what we have, like we have a really great cast for a lot of uh, quote unquote local actors it's a really great cast everybody was very talented and she legitimately would have dragged the whole project down so i mean not all money's good money right so yeah we were just like no nah, we're, we're gonna do it ourselves so we really focused we cut a lot of the bigger scenes out and a lot more dialogue and uh so we wound up having this uh a nice like 85 page, final 85 page shooting script. And then we held auditions in the city in Manhattan. We had three separate auditions because so many people came out. It was surprising. I guess, you know, people see a feature, they automatically just apply no matter what. So we wound up having to have uh, Saturdays and Sundays three separate times. So like the first time and then the second time we brought the people we liked that back along with new people. And we wound up uh, with we got the lead actor and we got, uh, I think he was the only one we initially cast. 
So the girl that, uh, well, the girl, the woman that plays uh, Mary Ann, which is the uh, prostitute, she, uh, uh, we initially cast her as the wife. We thought she was a little, because the, the wife in the in our original was a little, had a much smaller, uh, the prostitute in the movie had a much smaller role. So I was like, what if, she's, she was extremely talented. So I was like, what if we, I was talking to Nick, my partner, I was like, what if we cast her as a prostitute and expand the role? give her more depth, give her more meaning to this guy, which changes his perception of who he is. So we wound up, you know, we called her and I asked her if she would mind switching uh, roles and we would uh, switch, uh, switch, switch roles and we would give her a beefier part for it. So she was okay with it. And then we had a very hard time casting the wife afterwards. So uh after we got all the cast and everybody uh, you know we got the locations down we got all of this and then you know we got a crew we got uh everybody was set and then in um october the early october uh my mom passed away so uh she was actually supposed to uh my mom was sick obviously and uh she was actually supposed to play at the time she was like in and out of uh, like rehab facilities for that year. So at the time she was, uh, my mom was like obsessed with Frankie Valley music. So it kind of, you know, she wanted to do it and she was kind of uh, not wheelchair bound, but close enough to it. And she was supposed to play the mother as she was older. So if you remember, there was the mom when she was younger. Yeah. In the beginning of the film. My mom was supposed to be because there was no dialogue. She was not supposed to speak. She was just supposed to sit there. OK. And the character, Chris or Frankie, he would go and see his mother every week. And he would basically just tell her everything that he was, you know, he was up to. He was planning. So a lot of details that um, you get reasoning through there. That's kind of left open now because we couldn't we didn't wind up shooting it. So anyway, long story short, uh, my mom wound up passing away. And during that time, while we were there, the rehab facility that she was in was going to let us shoot there for free. When she passed away and everything, I went back to the rehab facility like a month later to, you know, pick up her stuff and, you know, get everything together. And the guy was like, well, we can't let you shoot here anymore. So, like we were only doing it because, you know, we were able to bill your mom's insurance for her stay. So since they weren't making money off of the they, deal, they weren't making any kind of money. Out. So they were just like, no. Yeah. And it kind of just didn't feel right to film after that, that whole thing. I mean, it was a big emotional chunk from the film, but uh, it just didn't feel right. So we wound up cutting it and we wound up just writing some like a diner scene to take its place that kind of took like 20 minutes out of from the mom and the emotion out and all the emotional uh, emotions to it. And we just put it in a small diner scene that really didn't come out the way we wanted to. That but, was with the uh, the prostitute? That and sequence? the wife, yeah. Oh, the, the so, death sequence with the two of them yeah, when they meet the up each other. That yep. was actually supposed to be Chris slash Frankie uh, divulging all this information to his mother through different, through different ways. I see. So he had the mother, you know, he was like wheeling her outside in the rehab. He was like, you know, talking to her, but talking to himself kind of thing because she couldn't respond. Yeah. So we wound up, you know, cutting that. And then the we had a crew and about two, not even two weeks, maybe 10 days before a shoot, our DP that we hired, not the DP that was on the film, but the DP we hired previously, he, uh, he calls me and tells me that he has a job in his country. Like, uh, he was from like, a, I want to say Chile or maybe Brazil, or Argentina, a country in South America. I can't remember right now, but. Uh, his dream job just opened up and it started shooting the second day into our film. I was like, all right, you know, you have contracts and everything. And he was like, you're going to have to sue me. He's like, I'm going to go. He came with the, uh, a gaffer makeup, brought DC, his own crew, everybody, pretty much his own crew, but audio. So well, he's like, I have a couple of guys, uh, you know, I could recommend. So, which he was nice enough to do. And one of them was the guy we wound up going with. Okay. So he came also with his uh, gaffer and grip and he came with like his own little smaller crew. 
That's good. That's lucky. Can't How did you that. find the original DP? Was it through connections? Was it through? Uh, uh, we we tried. I tried everything. We tried uh, Mandy, uh, Facebook groups, Craigslist. Uh, we're, you know, asking people that uh, I was kind of uh, trying to learn from at the time how to make the feature. Uh, I know somebody that made like a smaller indie movie, I guess you call it. He had like a $350,000 budget. So it was a little different than mine, but uh, he was like a local guy. So I wound up talking to him and getting, you know, some advice from him. And he gave me a couple of people and they were just too expensive. And uh, because they were all union DPs. So, Mm. you know, you kind of. Even if they don't take their union rate, they're not going to take your super low budget rate. Yeah. And, you know, we we extended uh, as much as we could on the crew, on the cast and crew. So we were kind of tapped. So I think we wound up getting him off of Mandy.com. Okay. Well, that's good. And then just word of mouth, oh, we got to make up artists through a friend. When looking at his work and deciding to go with him, was it a meeting with him that made you like him? Was it the quality of the stuff that he had available? Uh, well, he sent me his reel first. You're talking about the one we hired or the one uh, that we went the with? The one that you'd initially hired or either. But like, okay, it's well, it's yeah. interesting process of you know deciding crew members, I think. Well, back of- then, I wasn't... So um, I wasn't very experienced in hiring crew since I was usually the one being hired. So it was, uh, I kind of just went the real way. So they would send me the real, I would look at the real and then, uh, you know, kind of judge off of that. So yeah. now I, uh, I don't look at reels. Even as an actor, I won't look at a reel. I would, uh, you can send me a reel, but I want to see a completed piece of work. Because you're put, just putting your highlights on, I want to see the lowlights. Like, I want to see you mess up that angle, you know, here. Mm-hmm. Just so you really know what you're working with. You know, because everybody puts their best foot forward and you get screwed a lot of the times. So, and especially working with like audio sound recorders, a lot of them don't have final say in the audio sound. You know, most of it is done by the, you know, the sound editor. And so you can't really get, you can't really judge. So do you have your sound guy send you some original off the recorder sound? I try to, but a lot of, a lot of guys just don't, uh, they just send their reel or they send the project and you pretty much got to hope for the best. I mean, I come from music. So a lot of times I will just do the sound editing myself. So when they, if they send me, uh, it's like, I try not to, I mean, even though I like to be in control, like I can edit, I can DP if I really wanted to. Uh, I try to hire out all those when I do my own stuff. Yeah. But I kind of do try to take over the audio. Once all the files are sent to me, I kind of redo the audio a little bit. I was going to ask you about that because this film you wrote and directed, but you didn't edit. A a lot of writer directors prefer to edit their own work as Mm -hmm. well. So what went into that decision to not actually edit yourself? More of a collaborative thing. I really, I really feel film is like the ultimate collaborative effort. So yeah, I can edit. I can shoot. I can do sound if I wanted to. I can do lighting. So it's, you know, you're, you have your vision. So part of being a director is getting everybody on board with your vision and hearing ideas from them. So if this, I don't care if the the guy taking out the garbage has an idea, I'm going to listen to it. Like I'll listen to everybody's idea. And since now everything is digital, there's no film. We could, we could try his take and see how it is. If it's not good, we won't use it. Like if there's no, it's a little yeah. space on a card, you know, it's not, it's 10 minutes and you know, space on a card. It's not like film where, you know, you, you kind of got to stick to the plan because that, that role of film is like two CFAST cards or two CFAST express cards. So it's kind of, you know, a little, a little easier nowadays to take on everybody's word and see how it goes. And like, if an actor wants to try lines different ways, he can do that. You know, I'm not a stickler for that. I want to try it and see how it works. If it works, it works. It doesn't, you know, we wasted 20 minutes. Yeah. Not a big deal. I ramble on. What was the question? Editing the, the editing process. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't sure I was able to edit a full feature. So like I've edited music videos, the shorts we did. I just wasn't sure I could do a whole feature because I do uh, 
also, aside from, you know, the writing and everything, I do work a regular nine to five job. So I wasn't sure I had the time to really put into and accurately edit the film. So we wound up uh, the line producer on our film, uh, Vinny, he knew he worked for one of the morning shows here in New York. And uh, he had like a, a junior editor there that was like quickly rising up and he started editing dailies. So he's like, I have this guy, he wants to edit, a, he wants to edit film, just meet with him, see how much, you know, you guys can work out. So I wound up meeting with him and he sent me um, some short films he did earlier. So we wound up meeting, we talked and he was like, yeah, he's like, I'll, he's like, you know, I'll give you a significant discount if I could do it in my downtime. He's like, if I can't, if I don't have to rush and get it done, I was like, honestly, we're not in a rush because we kind of, obviously, you know, this was our first time doing a feature. We never really thought about the business side of it and how much there was to the business side of it. So when we finished, I'm looking at the business side and I'm like, uh, this is a lot more work than uh, we expected. So I told him, I was like, take your time. I was like, I legitimately have to read up on the business side and try to figure out a plan for it. So he was doing little by little, you know, he would get a couple hours here, a couple hours there, a couple hours there. And then he got the rough, the first rough cut. And it was pretty much what I had in mind for the most part. So, you know, we were going back and forth with notes and this and that. And then when I had the shoulder surgery, I was home for about a two months, like recovering. So he lived in the Bronx and I live all the way on the south, uh, south shore of Long Island. I would go to his house about two or three days a week uh, when we were trying to finalize it and just sit there for eight, nine hours and just go with him over every scene. Like, all right, we're gonna watch it and we're gonna edit it right there and just bang out that scene. So we would do like two scenes a day I would come back a couple of days later, two scenes, two scenes, two scenes, and we wound up finishing it that way. And then that's when we realized we got stuck with 60 something minutes and we really fucked up. <laughs> well, so. at least you didn't add stuff just for the sake of extending it, though, because I think that can be a mistake that some filmmakers make that they want to extend the runtime just so they can hit that hour and a half well, we timeline. Did. And it's we, like, you're like, yeah, but did you really need that scene? Yeah, we, we did extend it. We, uh, all the flashbacks in the film were the, the extension. Oh, okay. Did you so shoot we, uh, those later or? Yeah, we shot them in May of, so we shot the film in December of 2016, the eight days in a row. So that was all pretty much current, current day minus the, um, the father and son in the car. Okay. So the father and son in the car was actually part of the original film. So we, we needed some time and. A lot of the actors that we cast for that where we were going to bring back, they weren't available. And the little girl that we were going to bring back for some time, her, she completely changed looks because she was they like 11 fast. 12. Yeah, she looked, the day we shoot, the shot, she looked completely different from the audition, which was like five or six months previous. <laughs> so it was like, she didn't really have that innocent little girl anymore. Anymore looks, she looked like a young woman that she was, uh, you know, growing into. So we Wait, like, was that the older good. sister or the younger sister? The younger sister. The okay. younger sister. She she looked a lot younger during the audition. And then it's like she grew up overnight. So nice. kind of uh we kind of had to stick to it. Yeah, you didn't want to you be know, like, she, sorry, she you was. look too old now. You're too yeah. old for film. Go find another career. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, I mean it was that was that was probably the toughest part was uh trying to figure out what to put in there. To get because that extra. The, uh, yeah, because the actor wasn't around for two months like the lead actor okay so he's like i'm gone i'm gone from i think he was like april to june and then one of the other girls moved out to california then somebody else moved here so we wound up going through uh everybody that was higher up on our list that we didn't cast and trying to fit them in to place our uh, other roles so we wound up bringing um uh, the guy's sister the father's sister the mom we threw into the role and the young kid was still available. So we brought him and uh, Doug, who plays the flower, uh, the father. Okay. We brought them back and just wrote scenes that were supposed to take place in the uh, early to mid 80s, which is why it also has a different feel. I just kind of assumed that was intentional on the sense of if it takes place in the past, that is what gives it that different feel. Yeah, we try to give it a different feel also. We kind of sh we shot it a different way. Um, with that film, can I ask what the budget was? 
$30,000. So with that, because I was really curious how much of that budget was spent on music because you use actual Four Seasons songs, mm -hmm. which can't be cheap. No. <laughs> for the licensing. <laughs> um, so we paid for the, um, the festival rights to submit through the festivals and everything. And uh, we kind of shit the bed for a better term. Uh, we never applied for the master license. So when you pay for the festival rights, it's uh, supposed to be a certain percentage of the master license rights. So we're currently figuring that out right now because we have we had two we have an, uh, two offers for the film, and we weren't able to clear the music yet. So because of just the festival, the festival rights expired in October of 2021. What was last year? What year are we in? We just 20, turned 22. 22? <laughs> yeah. 22, yeah. So it was October 2021 was the, uh, the last of the festival rights. So we're trying to uh, go through it and it's very, very expensive. So we're kind of weighing our options because it's supposed to be a percentage and they're quote was significantly higher than it was supposed to be legally so we're kind of uh, working the details out do we pay that because we would have to take out a loan because it's that much money damn it's not uh i can't say the exact price because it's court oh no worries but but uh it's it's very very expensive like mortgage your house type of expensive yeah that doesn't surprise me that's why i was really surprised when i heard their music playing and I was curious what the deal was on that. So you got the rights to use it in festivals for a certain it amount was of time. Our, it was our, yeah, it was our but you don't have, but you can't sell the film now because you don't have the rights for that. We applied for the wrong license, and that was our fuck up. You know, first time filmmakers, we fuck something up. It's a learning you know, game, a exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, worst case scenario is that it's a. It was film school for me, basically. I never got the opportunity to go to film school, so I learned everything those in that process so i really fine-tuned like how to edit i learned from the dp i watched him very closely i watched the lighting very closely and from that since that shoot i've been doing that ever since so i've actually toned down the writing and started more on the filmmaking side on that directing controlling yeah. what's going on the set Just from stuff. watching the, the business end. work could you, I know, well, I guess it's really heavily influenced by their music, but like, I was just thinking like, if you cut their music out, how badly would that hurt the film? And it we doesn't tried. work. Okay. Um, it works for some scenes. It doesn't work for the end scene, which was, uh, I actually, um, the composer that's done my last two short films, he wanted to take a crack at it, but I didn't want him to make the, you know, to make, if we were able to, you know, get a reasonable deal. I didn't want him to waste the time and, you know, all the efforts to actually score, rescore the whole film because he'd have to rescore what wasn't scored already. Anything that's original, he would have to just change. I didn't want him to waste the time. Okay. So, I mean, I've tried, but uh, my music skills are pretty much equipment based that, you know, I can't play any instruments, you know, so I can play like a keyboard with already preset keys for instrument, you know, so that doesn't really help. And we tried with stock music. We tried looking for cheaper music that would fit. It just doesn't really fit. Well, that's it. Like anytime you make a film, it's a learning lesson. So that's a valuable lesson for anyone listening. Pay attention yeah, make to sure what you the right read the fine print. <laughs> there you go. Read the fine print. Don't just uh, check boxes. I really quickly want to ask you about um, mm -hmm. Double Zero. Uh, two questions on that. So that's a, basically it's a short film uh, about a couple criminals that get caught up in some mischief and. There's two questions I want to ask about that film. Sure. One, the opening sequence of that film has the two girls standing outside smoking cigarettes. How many cigarettes did they smoke that night filming that sequence? Uh, I can actually show you because they're right here. Really? So, yeah. They didn't actually just sit so, there smoking? So oh. this bag was full. Okay. okay. They're like uh, floral cigarettes. Yeah. So this thing was full. So they smoked that much, that many cigarettes. Nice. That's how much they smoked. So probably... 15 or 20, maybe. That's not too bad then. That, no, but well, it wasn't that bad. I, well, I did a short that was part of like a weekend, you know, let's make a film in a weekend, mm -hmm. one of those events thing. And I had a friend of mine play one of the characters in it, and she's a smoker. And I'm like, okay, great. We need her to smoke. 
And so, and she smokes regular. So we just had her smoking her regular cigarettes the whole time. And by the end, she was like, I can't smoke anymore. <laughs> like <laughs> Her throat had to be killing her. Yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, sorry, what were you going to say before I... Uh, the the actresses were actually pretty good. So all that was pretty much... Uh, they did everything in one take. So it was just one cigarette. There was nothing real to... Like, there was no continuity involved. So they did everything in one take. So we didn't have to be like, okay, there was this much cigarette before. Now there's only this. What are we going to do? So it was kind of timed perfectly where, you know, sometimes it's going to be this much difference, but you can't really tell. But they were good enough to do it in one take where they weren't flubbing lines. They were able to just blow right through it. It helps so much. And you didn't have sound problems because that was going to be my other question about shooting outside. There was a ton of sound problems. Yeah. Okay. There was a ton of sound problems. So we shot that in May of the, uh, of 2021. So New York was still uh, quote unquote locked down. They weren't really locked down, but the clubs were the clubs, bars, and everything were stopping uh, at 11, I believe, 11 o'clock at night. And if you've ever been to New York City, nothing ever shuts down. So it's open, usually open 24 seven. That's what so I wanted to ask because my memories of New York are of constant traffic noises. We wound up filming on a Friday night and three days before we were going to shoot, uh, Mayor de Blasio announced that the clubs will be opening up to full, full hours this Friday. It's like this motherfucker. Perfect. Time. This guy fucks up everything and he's going <laughs> to just fuck up my shoot now. So we wound up, uh, just having to deal there was, there was literally like, a. it wasn't a club, but it was like a lounge. It was packed to the brim. And it was a low roof. Like we weren't very high up. We were probably four stories up, but uh, it's a couple of blocks from the Empire State Building. So you have all that traffic right there. And it was a lounge up the block. And these guys, there was guys outside. They had their car radio blasting for a good portion of filming. We had guys walking up and down the street with radios blasting, traffic. I mean, it was it was still lighter than it should have been. I actually, um, we had to shoot some pickup scenes for a film I directed yesterday. So I directed a film earlier in uh, earlier in December for someone else, and uh, we had to shoot some pickup scenes. So she wanted a rooftop for uh, she wanted uh, not to shoot the pickup scene, and then she wanted like uh, you know just some like uh, film poster ideas. So she wanted to be on a rooftop for the film poster. So she wound up booking that same location. And when we were shooting the pickup scenes yesterday, I shot yesterday at like maybe two o'clock in the afternoon. And it was three times as loud as it was that Friday night. But there was tons more traffic, tons more everything. So hopefully that audio was well, but it took a lot to get that audio out. We wound up using more of uh, the lab mics okay. for the dialogue than the boom. And uh, there was no amount of noise reduction that was going to kill all that noise. So we tried to do it as best as we could. I put some fake traffic noise in there. To level it out when you cut back and forth between the two. Hopefully it doesn't sound too bad. I mean, it sounds okay in mine, but hopefully, you know, it doesn't sound too bad for everybody else. But uh, that was actually a very, very tough shoot. That went, that little two day film was 10 times worse than trying to figure out Into the Valley. And that, <laughs> this was probably my 10th film. So, you know, shooting, this was the first time we shot during COVID. So we wound up, the uh, the lead actress who plays Alvera, she was also in Into the Valley. And, and uh, the guy who plays Ray is a friend of mine. He's an actor, but he's also a friend. So I was like, you know, I have an open role, you know, come down. So he was picked that and then the two actresses uh you know i put an ad on backstage and we got a bunch of hits so i initially hired two different girls and then uh after you know negotiating and everything with the first girl i sent her the contract then i negotiated with the second girl sent her the contract the first girl comes back and she says i refuse to follow all the covid protocol i was like okay you know my insurance just won't cover so i can't have you on I mean, obviously, you know, everybody wants to be safe. And, you know, at the time, most of the people are younger, so they may, you know, who knows, right? But I was like, insurance is requiring that you 
you don't have to be vaccinated or anything, but you do have to take a test uh, 36 hours previously or 48 hours previously. And you got to submit it. You got to do this. You uh, have to be in a mask when you're not in front of the camera. And she absolutely refused to do all of that. Wow. So I told her to have a nice day. We'll just find somebody else. So then, uh, then I found um, the girl, Caroline, the blonde girl who plays um, Olivia. So I put her in the first girl spot. And then the other girl, maybe about three weeks before we were going to shoot. Sorry, three months before we were going to shoot. She, uh, not three months, we shot in May. So in April, beginning of April, she uh, she tested positive for COVID. So I was like, okay, you know, we'll wait. I could, you know, we still have time. We'll wait for you to heal up before we do anything. So 10 days passed and she tells me that she's having a rough time with it. So she doesn't want to hold me up any further. If she does get better before I hire somebody, then she'll let me know, but she's having a rough time which she wound up texting me after we shot and saying she was still having problems breathing and all kinds of issues. So I wound up going with uh, Vivian who plays Diana. And, but it was through, I think that one might've went through like seven different actresses for both roles to try to find somebody that would, yes, agree to COVID protocol, the testing and whatever the insurance was requiring and who was available and who was within our budget because the budget was significantly smaller. Yeah. Cause you don't really make money off short films. So no, same thing with the DP. He refused, uh, he refused to uh, follow any wear mask when he was shooting. He refused pretty much everything. So it was kind of like we had a last minute DP. We went through all the actors and actresses uh, same with the, the lighting guy. I actually fired a PA on like right before we started filming that day. So I fired like we shot upstairs on the roof for the, the beginning. I fired him downstairs before he even got upstairs. Because he wouldn't wear a mask? Yeah, he just came. He's like, I'm not doing it. I was like, you signed the contract. I was like, you know, the, the insurance. He's probably like, I didn't think somebody. you'd enforce it. You know, what do you, what do you expect? Yeah, like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't fuck around. You know, it's... <laughs> If there's a potential for, you know, me to get in trouble for it. Because, yeah, know, as the as the producer of the film, you're liable for that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, if you don't if you don't want to wear one on your time, that's fine. Now you're on my time. You know, the insurance says you have to have it. You have to have it. There's no if ands, or buts. And it has to cover your nose. Like, don't be one of those that wear it right, right here. I, it doesn't. Here's the thing. I don't, I'm not going to I don't want to get into the politics of it, but like it doesn't cause you physical pain to wear a fucking mask, right? Not at all. Like you can fucking breathe. Doctors do it all goddamn day long and manage to do seriously intense operations while wearing masks. So some jackass on the street can wear a fucking mask for a few hours while he's on a fucking film set. That's, that's just my opinion anyways. I mean, we were outside anyway. So it's like, you know, it was, it wasn't hot, you know, it wasn't freezing. It wasn't hot. It was like cool. It was like a New York spring. You know, so there was no reason for it. I mean, even like we wound up. So I shot two films during COVID. Well, two of my own and uh, I directed two during COVID. And just it drives people crazy. I I don't I don't know why. Mm, Yeah, I don't either. I mean, it's the new normal going forward. So either you're going to do it or you're not. Yeah, I agree. uh, If you want to be make films, then get used to it or do something else. Double zero is actually uh, before we go. I just wanted to say it's a uh, it's actually a a proof of concept for a TV series. So I wound up writing the entire first season. Oh, wow. Which is I mean, you're not supposed to do it, but I was so ingrained in the characters. I wound up writing the entire first season and a Bible. And then I was like, you know what? I need a short film. I need something to show, first of all, because, you know, it's been a year and nobody's done anything. So I wound up. So that's actually the uh, the penultimate episode chopped up into 20 minutes. So it's 75 pages long, the the actual episode. But I kind of took five minutes from the beginning, five minutes from here, five minutes from here, five minutes here. And dialogue from a different episode and all stuck it into that one to kind of create a cohesive uh, film. Hopefully it worked. Yeah. Are you shopping it around right now? Yeah. We actually uh, have a meeting on Wednesday. 
hopefully that goes well. Yeah, hopefully. Well, uh, anything else you want to mention that you're working on that you want to call out? Uh, I mean, I got a lot actually going <laughs> on this year. I really, I really do. Surprisingly, uh, so the Double Zero, which we're probably going to just put on YouTube in a couple of weeks, maybe. I mean, it's a short film. We can't really do nothing with it, but so we're probably throwing it on YouTube in a couple of weeks. I'm um, in post production for a short film called Star Star Cross. It's a uh, an emotional drama, uh, very intense. Uh, about a woman who loses her family and then uh, she wins the mega millions after her family passes away. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, you a lost beat. everything, but you, yeah. uh, it's not a beat at all. No, not I was being sarcastic there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Not even sarcastic. <laughs> upbeat. It's, it's sad. I directed a, um, a proof of concept uh, stage play. So uh, this woman wrote a, a play and I directed her short film that she's using to shop with uh, her stage play. Uh, we have a horror uh, web series that we're going to start shooting in September. Uh-huh. Uh, one, two, three more short films. And possibly we had a feature that we uh, actually we lost funding for. Uh, we got financed through a local businessman. And he wound up dying of COVID in 2020. So we kind of lost funding. And that's when we kind of shifted to do the short films, just to uh, kind of give more of a resume so we can shop that film a little better nowadays. So hopefully all that gets done, but everything is actually set, has shoot dates, except for the, the feature. So we got a bunch of stuff going on. Well, that's great. And hopefully it all works out. Well, any like website, social media channels you want to call out for uh, people to check on the status of any of that? Yeah. Um, my website is always right. W R I T E pat.com. And uh, it's always right. W R R I blah, 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 blah. Always right. Pat at all the social medias, YouTube, Instagram, except TikTok. I'm too old for TikTok. I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, people ask me. Old. Yeah. You know, They're like, are you go, on TikTok? And I'm like, no, because I'm not a go, teenager. I just want to say to actors, your TikToks are not part of your reel. Oh, do you get people TikToks I as part of their reel? I get a ton of people sending me TikTok, voiceover TikToks. So somebody did a whole TikTok with the voiceover uh, from, what the fuck movie was it? Uh, the one with Ryan Gosling and Eva Mendes. I don't remember... Uh, yeah, that's an older one. Um, I don't remember what the name of the movie was. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. I can't think of it either. He sent me the entire monologue, but in Ryan Gosling's voice with him just mouthing the words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I can't. But I've received a ton of TikToks oh, for wow. people sending me for auditions. So please, please don't do that. That's awful. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. it's entertaining the first couple of times you see it. It's pretty funny. But then when it's like we had probably 400 girls submit for double zero. So I'd say probably like 20 of them had TikToks in their reel. It's, pre- it's pretty fucking funny when you first see it. I'm telling you, it's, <laughs> al- it's hilarious. It doesn't surprise me at all, though. It really doesn't. But um, yeah, I, I, I would imagine as soon as you see that, it's like that's an easy no. Right there. I mean, I did have a couple of them just send me just just for, for fun, for my own entertainment, not for anything more than that. I'm sorry <laughs> I, I wasted your time, but it, it was funny. I had to just see for myself if that person could really act or if it was just, you know, sorry to waste your time. But it was pretty funny. Well, that's what they get for sending TikTok reels for audition yeah. tapes. What's your opinion on people doing monologues for audition tapes as well, like to the camera monologues? For me, it's a no, because you're basically, it's basically a copy. Like you're, I mean, if it's a self-written monologue for something that's not, you know, even if you want to do something obscure that nobody would know, nobody's going to know, right? But, you know, when you're doing Denzel Washington from Training Day, you're doing something that's just, people know what it is. You're, You're imitating somebody else. It's not really you. So, and I would actually... I would rather see a short film or a completed piece of work that you've done than a reel. But even my, like I, people do self tapes and they put it in their reel. So I'm like, I kind of don't want to see that. Like I want to see you on camera, you know, cause it's not always about 
how you, you know, say the words, how you deliver the lines on camera. It's not just how you sound. You know, I want to see how you move while you're acting, like a real time, not, you know, just reading in front of the camera on book. So I kind of, I would rather see that. But I, I, that I also don't know why people put in their reels, like, uh, you know, self tapes. Scenes from a self tape. I mean, I guess it's, I mean, it's good if you don't have that, uh, you know, that experience yet. Yeah. But if you, if you have plenty of credits, you know, you should at least get your footage from the film. Even if the film never comes out, which what, like 30% of films never see the light of day, maybe even more small, short, independent films never see the light of day. Yeah. So I get it. You know, footage of, and a lot of directors are assholes with the footage. They won't send it. Like I actually uh, DP'd a short film for somebody and I have yet to see the footage. It's been about a year. Oh, I've done a few things that I've never seen footage from. Yeah. But, you know, send, you know, send the person the footage, like, it's, pro- it's most likely it's in your contract, right? That you get the footage within a certain amount of time. Send the footage. Don't be an asshole about it. But, you know, it's good. It helps because, you know, that person doesn't have to have that self-tape now in the reel. You know, you exactly. can actually have the scene in it instead of the self-tape being made for you. Which I know it probably sucks as an actor that you have to do, you know, that you would have to do that if you, you know, don't have it. But it's fucking directors, man. They suck. Directors, worst people. They're, they are the worst people. They're so fucking bad. <laughs> All right, Pat. Well, it was great talking to you, man. I really appreciate you sure, it. Man. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it.